Welcome to the Seeds of Wisdom series. We hope you enjoy today's guest. Disclaimer, the people sharing their perspectives on this episode are not mental health professionals. We are speaking from our own personal experience on the subject matter. We sought mental health support from professionals. If you are suffering, please seek appropriate support. It's worth it because you're worth it. Hello and welcome to the 13th episode of Seeds of Wisdom brought to you by From a Loving Place with author Rachel Wolf. I'm Rachel Wolf and today I am so excited to have author, memoirist, Mary Beth O'Connor and her book is From Junkie to Judge and I was blessed enough to get a pre-copy of the book to read for this And I could not put it down. And I am someone who reads a lot of memoirs, but rarely about addiction and trauma have I read a memoir so incredibly powerful that I was like screaming out loud, yes, 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 throughout the whole book because of how detailed and how authentic and honest she gets in this book. I'm going to let Mary Beth introduce herself before we jump into the topic of accepting incremental progress, which is such an important piece of the puzzle. So with that, Mary Beth, please introduce yourself. So hello. Yes, Mary Beth O'Connor. The full title of the book is From Junkie to Judge, One Woman's Triumph Over Trauma and Addiction. Uh, I see the short version of my story is that child abuse led to child addiction. I was not really bonded to my mother. She wasn't connected to us, which was problematic. Um, She could be violent. She was violent at times. But when I was nine, we moved in with my stepfather, who was very violent to her, uh, verbally, emotionally, physically, sexually violent to me. And it was a a household where it wasn't every day. It was that you never knew what was going to set him off or when it was gonna happen. And so there was, it was just a high stress environment with little control. I did develop some techniques to reduce the episodes, but I could not eliminate them no matter what I did. So I picked up alcohol, which was my first drug when I was 12. And then I moved on to pot, then pills, did a lot of acid my sophomore year of high school. And when I was 16, I found my drug of choice, which was methamphetamine. And at 17, I was shooting meth on a regular basis and in full bore addiction when I graduated high school. I did manage to put it under better control and I emphasize better control in in college for the first few years. I mostly used alcohol, pills sometimes, coke sometimes, mostly on the weekends. But I had a really bad multi-assailant rape in college, moved in with a violent boyfriend, and I started using meth again in January of my senior year. And I did not get sober until I was 32 years old. And so by then, I was having a lot of physical problems. I had destroyed most areas of my life. And I went into rehab where they told me that the 12 steps was the only recovery approach. And that was not a good fit for me for multiple reasons. So I had to build a plan that worked for me. I pulled the ideas from rehab and from 12 steps that I thought would be helpful. And I just ignored the other ideas. And then I found several secular options and participated in those programs as well. And just put together a sort of a synthesized hybrid approach that has so far led to 28 years of sobriety. Um, Professionally, when I started to build back up. I had to start at a low level job, but eventually at six and a half years sober, I went to Berkeley Law School. And at 20 years sober, I was appointed a federal administrative law judge. I took early retirement in 2020. And now I'm an advocate about multiple paths to recovery. I talk about the trauma substance use disorder connection. I'm on the board for She Recovers Foundation and Life Rings Cycler Recovery. And I talk to as many people as I can by doing things like this podcast today. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here. And obviously with the recovery and all of that, your book covers so much range. And then it goes into the fact that you became a federal judge on top of that. So you were able to keep up your schooling through through a drug addiction, teenage drug addiction, and keep up your grades. You want to talk a little bit about that? 
So in high school, by the time I started really using meth a lot, it was sort of towards the end of my junior year. And I applied to college, of course, in the fall, I think, and got accepted by January. So by the by the time I was getting more and more out of control, I mean, I had problems controlling alcohol, I had problems controlling the other drugs, but meth was a whole new level for me. By the time it got really, really bad, I had already been accepted to college. And so I was just sort of uh, running the clock out on high school. And my senior year, the last few months, I did miss a lot of school, but I had always been a good student. And I said I had family problems and they let me make up the work. Mm -hmm. And then when I went to college, I did do better for those couple of years. And so, cause I wouldn't, I really wouldn't have been able to keep up college. It would have been impossible if I, if I entered college and kept going where I was when I graduated from high school, it would have been an impossibility, but I did get some partial control for the first couple of years. And so that allowed me to graduate from Berkeley. Uh, I mean, I will tell anybody who wants to gain any amount of compassion for addiction and understand the, the connection of trauma and addiction, please read this book, please. Because Honestly, it helped me get to a point of compassion. Like I'm a compassionate person, but addiction is one of those things that I can, it's, it, I have, I have guards around myself around sometimes. And, and sometimes it's harder to break through that compassionate wall, but understanding it from such a deep, authentic level of the trauma really helped me understand on a level of studying it from the college level because that's what I studied was, was all this kind of stuff but from the humanity level it just helped it get to a different place and so jumping into that seed of accepting incremental progress when you have gone through so much both trauma and addiction what does incremental progress look like to you? I mean, for one thing, I think for those of us in an abusive household, there is not a strong connection between your actions and the consequences, right? And so that can be problematic because you don't really see that my efforts have this outcome. And so you're not really brought up with that sort of idea, that experience. And then when I went into recovery, I know I, and I think I, all the women in my program, we wanted recovery to be much, to be quick, six months to a year. It should be like, we never picked up a drug, right? People wanted to have their kids back in three months or, you know, or, or for me, I had a Berkeley education and high grades. And so it would have been nice to be able to leap into a job that my education qualified me for, but that wasn't where I was. And that wasn't a realistic first start. So it was really about trying to scale back expectations or hopes and think about um, what, where am I really? And realistically, what's my initial plan? What's my, what are my initial goals? What are my first steps back into the real world, back into um, really for the first time for me into developing professionally, repairing my relationships, improving my physical health, my mental health, uh, you know, with the trauma, I had PTSD. So it was all of those things. There was no leaping that was going to happen over, you know, the hurdles. It was really going to have to be a, a slow process. Well, and I think that's such an important thing is understanding that it doesn't jump and, and, you know, we start taking steps and then there, it's like our old patterns might come up and sneak up and go, Oh, Hey, look over here. I mean, you know, this is easier <laughs> because it's what we did for 15, 20 years. And that doesn't even matter if it's addiction or just any kind of behavior pattern that is not healthy for us. And I love what you said, because it reminded me of when I was in Al-Anon, my sponsor had said to me, how old are you? And at the time I was 40. And she said, look how long it took you to get here. That's a lot of patterns. That's a lot of behaviors. So, you know, understanding that we have to undo 
<laughs> and then rebuild is such an important part. What was for you the most challenging aspect of accepting getting to the place of not just knowing it yeah yeah i should but really accepting incremental progress well it makes me think of a couple things one of them is that for me um a lot of i think because of the trauma and just my general you know the ptsd that i didn't know i have and the severe anxiety that it caused my perspective was always negative I mean, I was always hyper aware of the losses of what I didn't have or what I could have had if I hadn't been, you know, stuck in a drug addiction for all those years. That was natural to me. I was very aware of all that. And so for me to, to see progress, I actually had to consciously force myself to pause and look backward. How far have I come in these three months, in this six months, in this one year to really teach myself and to see that forward momentum to see, to be able to see the progress and also to reassure myself that there was no indication so far that I had sort of peaked out on where all my progress or where I was headed. Look what how much you've done in six months. You're still moving forward. You're still having positive things. And, and that really, that re process repeated and repeated really did make me get sort of calmer about the fact that, uh, yes, I might not have everything that I want, but in the long run, I can certainly have a vast improvement over where I am today. I still didn't believe I would end up where I am. I never even imagined that my life would be as good as it is, but I could, with that technique, start to believe it was going to be better. You know, it was going to be better. It was going to be adequate. I would have what I needed, but it took, it took really forcing myself to stop and look backward to get to that level of understanding. Now, and, and what I love about both listening to you in other podcasts that I've heard and reading your book is you don't just talk about incremental progress in your recovery or your career, in your relationship too. And with your relationship, um, which started while you were in active ad addiction and it helped kind of push you <laughs> in, in your own way to work, start even go, taking that path. So will you talk a little bit about that aspect? Yeah. So my partner at the time, um, you know, we, we, when we met, I was using, but he lived away, you know, 40 miles away from me. And he thought I was just using on the weekend. Like I was a casual, you know, user. And it wasn't until we moved in together that three year and a half years later that he realized, oh no, this, she has a problem. <laughs> and um, it was a surprise to him. And he still didn't really, he never really fully appreciated that I felt unable to stop. I mean, obviously I could stop because I did, but it didn't feel that way when I was immersed in it. He thought, well, she can stop anytime she wants. And so anytime I would sort of temporarily moderate, you know, you know, in an, a, an addiction, you try all kinds of techniques. I try to, you know, only use from Friday to Sunday or only every other week or, you know, all these different patterns. He would think, well, maybe she's getting it under control when really that was not going to happen. Um, so by the time I went into rehab, he was he was done. I and mean, we've been together for for nine years at the time, and he was ready to throw me out. And even in rehab, he came to the the uh, couples counseling sessions that they offered, but he was very angry about the whole thing that he felt like he I, I had just abused him, not you know, emotionally abused him. I wasn't a partner he could trust or rely on. He didn't really think it was ever going to work, which terrified me, you know, because it sounded like it was over. Um, but he did let me come home and we went to couples counseling for several years and over time through the counseling and hard work, you know, be, both of us having to listen to each other and having to take some responsibility, but also a lot of it was about, I wasn't doing that behavior anymore. And so he let me stay long enough to see that, oh yeah, she's behaving in a new way. She's actually making progress. She's going to her meetings. She's in therapy. She's improving. Her interpersonal skills, while still not good, are better. <laughs> um, and so it was that 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 hope, that time that he saw me moving forward that allowed him to stick it out. And so at about a year and a half, I think we were pretty sure, yes, we're going to make it. And then we got married 
um, uh, I had three years sober when we got married, but even then we still had more work to do. I mean, you know, relationship is a constant ongoing yeah. improvement, right? So, but we did, we did work hard at it and it really did take time from when I went to rehab. I, it really was probably close to a year and a half before we both felt like, all right, this, this is going to stick. We're going to make it through. Yeah. And you know, you say a key word is we worked hard because it's not just if there's one addict and the other person's not an addict, it's not one person that just the addict has to do the work. Both people do because the patterns that have been created in the relationship have to shift. (laughs) That's right. And I had some anger of my own. I felt, why didn't you help me more? You know, like if you saw me, if I was ill with anything else, you would have, you know, done something, but he just felt so overwhelmed and he didn't know what to do. And he is the kind of guy that does get overwhelmed with that kind of thing. But I had some anger myself. Like you did not call you know treatment facilities or try to get me in you just sort of stood back and watched and so we had to talk that through as well it was both sides but mostly you're right we just didn't know how to communicate in a healthy way we had established bad patterns and we had a both had a lot of emotions so lack of skills and high emotions is a recipe for disaster unless you work hard to improve it absolutely yeah and 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 if you hadn't grown together it would have been natural for you to grow apart, but because you were both willing to grow together, that you know, it moved forward, which I love I love that part of your story too, is because it's incre- it it's so vividly shared the incremental in every aspect of where you were and and your experiences and you know, and then because I can follow you on social media like everybody else, I can see what you're doing now with all of it. And it's it's just such a hopeful story because I think sometimes we can convince ourselves that because we went through this, whether it's the trauma or the addiction or whatever, because I did this, because I went through this, I can't get here. And that's, I feel like why your story is so important because it's not just career. It's not just recovery. They all went together as you grew. Yeah, I mean, that's why I'm a couple of things there. One, the reason I call the story Junkie to Judge is I really feel like it's a short um, phrase to say from no matter where you start out, you can have success in your life. And I mean, for me, I, I try to remind people I had a child abuse history. I had a child sexual assault history. I had two multi assailant rapes. I moved in with a violent boyfriend. Um, I lived with stress, you know, most of my, all of my teenage years with my stepfather, and I had a 20 year substance use disorder. And yet at 32, I was being be able to begin the forward momentum and to move forward from there. So it, to me, it is a way of saying, you know, don't give up on anyone. Let's do what we can to help everyone because they can get better. They may not know how. They may not believe it, but they can. Let's encourage it. Let's, you know, if we, to the extent we can, those of us in recovery, be open to to remind people or reassure people that it's possible. Um, all of those things that you said, absolutely. Yeah, it's well, and it's and it takes a personal story because it's not just a, those outside sources and and like as I'm sure you know, we can't change or fix anybody they have to see it themselves. And I just feel like sometimes when we tell our stories so raw, so authentic, that's when they see the potential of that in themselves. Yeah, it was important for me. I I am not a 12 step person and I talk about that in my book, but I will say one of the things that I did uh, get out of 12 steps when I went to the meetings was the drug logs, you know, the stories. A lot of people don't like them and over time, you know, they wear, but in the beginning, for me to see someone standing up and talking and telling her story of how um, how she had shot meth or heroin or whatever, and her life had been destroyed like my life had been destroyed. And then I'm looking at her and she has six months or a year or two years sober and she looks healthy and she has a job and she's paying off her debt. And, you know, she's able to engage people in a positive way. That did give me some hope that if she could do it, I could do it too. And so now it's my turn to stand up and offer that hope to others. I, yes, I, I love that. And thank you so much for coming on and explaining 
the incremental progress and the accepting of it and accepting is such a key part because first we have to see you know we have to see it become aware of it so that we can shift and grow but if we don't accept it we're actually creating obstacles you know so thank you yes yes i mean sometimes when i saw people that were struggling it was because they were trying to leap forward too fast and so it can be a better technique to just accept the next step it's i talk about how did i become a judge you know how i became a judge what's the right next step for 20 years that's how I became a judge, right? I mean, it was always about what, where, where am I now? What's my right next goal? And what do I need to do to achieve that goal? And then work toward that. But it wasn't about knowing what I wanted in 20 years. You don't have to look that far forward. Mm -hmm. Just what's the right next goal? What do I need to do to reach that right next goal? And then I'll think about the goal after that, you know, incremental step-by-step. Step. That's really how life works. We just don't always see it or appreciate it or understand it and if we can be conscious of it and make conscious choices and do a thoughtful analysis i think it's to our advantage yeah and and what you were saying is like about it, what's right step for you may yes. not be the right step for somebody else but it's being able to step back far enough to go okay this is working for me this isn't working for me this is this step isn't the next right step but this way is, you know, and because there is no one right way. Yeah. And the other side of that is sometimes when we try to carry out what looked like the right next step, we realize it isn't. And so it's okay. And you should be constantly reassessing because until you start to head towards something, you don't always really understand what it's going to be. So it's okay to change your mind. It's okay to update your analysis. It's okay to revise your goals as well. Wow. So that is so, so important right there, because that for me, I could get stuck with everybody. If I thought other people thought I should do something, get stuck in that path that other uh, people wanted for me. And it never led to a good place. I mean, and it would constantly track for me. It's the PTSD. It would put me into that freeze, freeze response because I knew it wasn't right yet I didn't know how to stand up for myself. So I went into that shell, <laughs> you know? And so understanding that just because something's right for one person and it can look different for you and you can try the things and if it doesn't work to go, okay, reassess. Reassess is such an important step. Exactly, exactly right. So with that, this is the end of the episode but Mary Beth has agreed to stay on with me longer to go beyond the seed and talk more about trauma and addiction, which will be available only on the YouTube channel, the From a Loving Place YouTube channel. So if you're listening on any other uh, platform, please, if you want to hear this extended conversation, go there. Thank you so much for coming on. And if you are listening to this, just trust that you are meant to hear what something in here. So thank you. And thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> and now beyond, beyond the seed. Okay. I really wanted to talk to you about more about trauma and addiction, because I do feel like there's so much elements of this and intervention too, because we were talking about how stories can look different based on just because someone has experienced trauma doesn't always lead to addiction if there's an intervention too. So let's talk a little bit about it because your experience is there was no intervention. You didn't have that safe place in at home. You didn't have, you know, your, your, because you were doing so well in school, your teachers didn't recognize. So that path, get to addiction is that trauma response to make the trauma better right right I mean look so it's a couple of factors one is I didn't have a bond with my mother because you know so there was no even when things went really bad with my stepfather I had nowhere to turn I knew she was useless to me she wasn't going to intervene and so that was problematic but 
Um, when I went into rehab, which was a women's program, I will tell you that probably 95%, maybe 100, all had trauma histories. And it is, if you have a trauma history, especially as a child, you're four to six times as likely to develop a substance use disorder. And you're right, not everyone does. Some people react to trauma in more productive ways, or they develop other behavioral disorders or, you know, or other um other behaviors that aren't in their own best interest, but it is a common pattern for child abuse to lead to child addiction. And I do think we underappreciate that. And for me, it's part of about recognizing substance use disorder as a medical condition, but also as a mental health condition that we're choosing it. And I, and I will say, in the beginning, it seemed to work, right? I mean, it seemed to help me in the beginning. I wouldn't have kept doing it if it was a horrible experience the first few times. But I felt I felt like I could breathe like at a deeper level. You know, I was felt like I could engage with my friends and have fun in a way I really hadn't been able to experience before. So it seemed in the beginning to help. It's just that it the positive side doesn't last very long, and then it became my number one problem. So it is, I, I did include it in the book because I wanted people, the reader to see the progression. What, what led up to it? Why did it seem like a good idea? Well, in you know, my experience where I was starting that path, I, I went, um, I think I had my first drink at nine years old, and there wasn't a lot of adults paying attention <laughs> at the time. And I didn't know it at the time, but I had experienced some form of sexual trauma. I didn't even know that until I was studying to become a preschool teacher and learned about how kids play and how it can show if they were sexually abused based on how they played. I didn't even know that was after I had kids. So that had happened. I could not remember blocks of my childhood. And this is, I feel like so common with trauma is if the trauma happens so young, your brain protects it. You can't even remember it. And so a lot of people will go into addiction because they don't even know what they're trying to cover up. They just know something doesn't feel right inside them you know, and that was the path I had started to take early on. But luckily for me, I had that intervention where I was put into treatment at 14. And that's where I learned to feel my, my how important feeling my feelings was not, not bearing my feelings, I feel because not blaming other people for my feelings, but just taking what I didn't know that the difference at the time, I blamed and shamed myself anytime I thought somebody else was responding, <laughs> you know, anybody else did something. I'm like, well, that has to, I can't blame them. So then it's self, it's self. So even when I was raped, it was self-blame, self-shaming, because I didn't know the difference between taking responsibility and accountability for what's inside me versus blaming and shaming myself. I didn't see that that was self-abuse. And, but I feel like in my case, I was really fortunate because when I did go into treatment, my mom changed with me. She, like as with, you know, with your partner at the time, she, she was willing to do the work too. So it wasn't, she had to show up differently for me than she ever had before because she, she didn't, she wasn't educated in how to do that. She came from one of 13 kids, you know, she was one of 13 kids. So it, the parenting is very different when you, when you're in those kind of atmospheres and um, yeah, so it's like trauma leading to that is very easy. And I most definitely would have easily taken that path if I hadn't been, had that intervention one for me, but for two, for having someone willing to change with me. Because I think that was a very big piece because if the family environment didn't change, it would have been too easy for a, you know, 14 year old to just jump right back into the old way. Well, you know, it's interesting that, I mean, first of all, I'm sorry for all that, um, but although I'm glad to see you in a healthy place, but it's interesting that you say that because I talk to friends and family sometimes, and they will ask me about, you know, what they should do. 
uh, if their child's having a substance problem. And one of the things I always do say is that, you know, I think they need to be evaluated for what other mental health issues may be going on, because it's not uncommon for uh, substance use disorder to be a reaction either to trauma or to a biological mental health illness, right? People who are have psychotic tendencies or who are bipolar or just depressed or anxious can use medications and drugs to, as well. And so it is important when you go into treatment to look at the whole picture. And that does include the family dynamic that someone's living in. But um, but it also includes making sure that it, is there more than one thing going on, which often there is, and addressing both. I mean, now the, the treatment facilities are much better at dual diagnosis um, uh, treatment, but still a lot of uh, uh, programs will say dual diagnosis, but it, it really varies what that means. And so I yeah. always recommend that parents ask specifically what exactly does that mean? Are, are you going to medicate them if they need it? Is there a psychiatrist they'll see regularly? How much counseling are they going to get? What kind of groups are they in? Is it really just throwing a term around because it sounds good? Or are they really um, Do they really have the resources to properly treat both? Because it is important. The odds of succeeding in the substance use disorder are going to be better if the trauma is um, addressed, if the other mental health issues are addressed. Yeah. Well, well and you bring up a point that reminded me of the fact that trauma therapy has changed so much from the time I was a teenager to what trauma therapy looks like now is totally different and so much more effective. <laughs> so, you know, I, I was actually in the beginning treated like once I was a victim of rape, I would always be a victim. And I had to oh. live under that victim mentality my entire life because I was raped. This will never feel the same because I was raped. This will be, you know what I mean? It was just like, that was embedded in me that I was always going to be different because of a trauma. And that was just the one I knew about, you know? And so the, the new therapies, I, I just, they were so effective in pulling out that no you were a victim at this point, you know, and your brains can change brain, you know, the brains move and grow and, and, and shift and new, there's new connections all the time. What a relief. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then also that reminds me of the terminology changing from victim to survivor, right? Yes. And survivor is a much more empowering term. You have overcome it. I mean, it's never going to be erased completely, but that doesn't mean you can't heal. Oh. And I will say when I, I, I did individual therapy for several years when I first got, uh, you know, sober, um, but I also then did a group for women with trauma histories and that, oh my gosh, it was so enlightening to me. Because I knew the big, high level, obvious trauma reactions I was having, like I would be jumpy, you know, I was worried about being with strange men and just me, especially in the dark or just a, a, a lot of other things. But I didn't appreciate the more nuanced responses until I was in that trauma group. And when they would be talking about concerns they had or their reactions to things, um, and they were tying it to their trauma. And I would, well, I do that too. I never, I thought that was just who I was. I didn't know that that was a trauma response. So that really was eye opening. And it pointed me in new areas that I needed to work on to heal, new areas where I needed to heal. That was really helpful. And I do remember also one time where the therapist asked the group to identify what their, what they needed, what was their need from their family. Um, and I, and I was confused. It's like need, what do you mean need? You're, you're not allowed to need things. And the other women had answers. And I was like, well, what is this? Like, it was such an eye opener at the, the levels. Cause there's so many different levels of my trauma reaction. And I was only really aware of probably the top 25% until I really started doing that focused trauma work. And, and even now I still say I'm mostly recovered from the PTSD and anxiety. I, I depending on the day I say I'm 92 or 95% recovered, <laughs> um, but, um, but with the work and I did do medication for a while as well. And that was helpful. Um, for me now, it still rears its head, the catastrophizing, which is sort of my my, I used to think my inherent nature, but no, a trauma response. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> That's what it was. 
Um, it happens, but it's much less often and it's much less intense and it lasts for a lot less time. And so uh, it is so, so much better, but it does take work. It took me longer to feel stabilized in my mental health um, conditions than it did my substance use disorder. It was easier to get a handle and really get um, my substance use disorder under very good control. That was a quicker process than the mental health side. Yeah. And I agree. And because there is no one right way and it's, it's a lot of try this if it does, you know, and trying different things. I know there's been points in my recovery of feeling like it didn't work. So I'm just, you know what I mean? And, and it, creating that block for me well I'm not going to try and it's nothing's working throw the hands up <laughs> you know and uh and my my what I would always go back to is self-abuse I I would just always go back to that self-abuse and then it when I really found things that worked and found that it was okay that it didn't look like anybody else's path that I had you know, encountered before. And then that was okay. That was huge. It's like accepting that my path can look different and still be forward and still take me to where I wanted to go. And, you know, I write, you know, I write a blog called from a loving place. I have a Facebook called from a loving place and everything. And this is all a part of it. And people would think it's positivity. And I would have to explain to them from a love, love is not about positivity love is being about me being authentic with myself and if I start feeling feelings that are painful is to wrap them in love instead of self-abusing you know for me that was a key piece in what launched me to be able to start moving authentically forward you know, it's interesting that you say that because it makes me think that my, my my spinning was a sort of a self-abuse, right? I mean, I could just spin and spin and spin on minor things that I thought that I thought were much bigger deal than they were that I really I was always worried about the worst possible outcome. And it, I remember telling my therapist, it's not that I'm saying that's going to happen, but it really, really could. And so I have to worry about it and I have to give my mental energy here. And then I spin and ruminate. And I, I remember there were times where I would leave myself like literally like two dozen voicemails at night about something that I thought I had done wrong during the day that I thought I would get in trouble for the next day. When, when I listened to it in the morning, it was not, there was nothing there. It was, but it was, a, it was a, an emotional upheaval. I mean, I felt it at a very deep level and I really had trouble letting go of it. And it took, it took quite a while to be able to learn to do that. Um, and it was, it was just not a happy place to be. I talk about my substance use recovery as it ties to my mental health, my trauma recovery in that I was doing the right next step for several years in my substance use recovery before I was able to enjoy my, my, to really feel proud of my accomplishments. I was able to notice them. I did make myself notice them, but I didn't get to feel the sort of the pride and the joy that I should have because I was always worried about the next, next event that could be a catastrophe. And so it just wasn't, yes, I was doing what I needed to do. I was making positive progress, but I wasn't really enjoying it in the way that I deserved to enjoy it until I started to get my trauma responses under better control. Yeah. And I find that I still work on some of that stuff because um, I'm a mom of two teenagers now. So they're at the ages that I was going through the worst of my <laughs> stuff, you know? And so things get triggered and I can go, oh, that's still there. <laughs> I didn't know that was still there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and, it, and it's just such an awareness, but the great thing about the incremental progress and having progress is I can, even if it comes up, I can spot it. Right. And I can go, oh, that's interesting. Oh, okay. Maybe this, okay. I have to negotiate what I'm doing here because, you know, even with uh, that outward seeking all the time. I was finding myself getting into those patterns of, oh, the worry, but what if it doesn't happen? Well, if, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. and I'm like, but if I focus right here and what I can do right now in the step I can take right now, it really helped me become more aware of every time I get triggered, 
you know, of these little things of how I can shift it in the moment instead of going, well, I have to start meditating and be meditating every single moment of my life and doing this work and doing that work. And if I don't do that, I'm going to fall up. You know what I mean? It just, I had to make that shift of stop trying to be somewhere else because it, that's going to be better. You know, the other thought I have about that is I think partly I have a fantasy that other people are always on their best behavior are always emotionally regulated. And the reality is they're not either. You know, I mean, I do feel like I have gotten to the point where I'm at least close to the normal range, you know, the average range I'm within that. And to expect to have perfect equanimity, no matter what the situation is and have nothing push a button to have no response. That's an unrealistic standard that we can set for ourselves. It actually isn't very helpful, but what you talked about is the helpful. Oh, look, this is triggering me. You know, that's interesting. I haven't had this happen in a while or what exactly about it is triggering me and what do I want to do for next steps? That's the, that's a healthy reaction. I think if we're going to always be like on this level plane forever, that's that's unrealistic and a, a standard that we should not be setting for no. ourselves. <laughs> no. And sometimes I know like, in, and you know, I write self-help, but I write a different kind of self-help because one of the things that I used to have, struggle with is people who would talk like they're always at this level and so I would feel like a failure if I went if I couldn't get there and so like the books that I write are about the inward journey or about going in or about um you know the process not we're always up here <laughs> good (laughs) (laughs) we're not not gonna be you know it's not gonna affect us it's gonna affect us differently yes yes because that thing in and one of the things that I got from 12-step programs because I was in the Al-Anon and then in treat you know treatment at 14 was that awareness acceptance action and that was such a key thing for me is first to understand I have to be aware of it I have to see it if I don't see it I can't do anything with it right and then accept, okay, this is where I am and then move forward. But it can happen all at once, but other times it might not, you know, and it's just accepting whatever it, whatever place that is. And I feel like, especially with trauma triggers, you know, my go-to is freeze with the PTSD. And so when people are coming at me or things are coming at me, I'm like, <laughs> put me in my little my cocoon and like hide me away for a while so I for me it's like understanding when I get to freeze okay what when I'm not there what are some things I can do to move me just out of freeze and like for me it's washing my hands and paying attention to it you know and and it's doing the dishes or doing the laundry in a way that I'm just right with it and that's the, at times that's the only thing that can move me out of it is those little things. And that's interesting because, you know, for me, my natural historical reaction is aggression, you know? Yeah. And so, right. uh, and so, I mean, I mean, so, sometimes I did the freeze with the trauma when I knew I ha- there was nothing I could do about it. But uh, if I, if I thought, and it was of course happening unconsciously that there was any chance that me being aggressive could push things away from me or backward or surprise the other person. Um, that's what I would do. It was also what my mother modeled. My mother was very verbally aggressive. You know, she could be physically aggressive. And so that's what I learned. And so uh, for me, that is part of my natural reaction. But the reality is that I ended up treating people in ways that I didn't want to treat them, even when it was effective, even when I attained what I was seeking because of it, I was doing it in a way that I wasn't happy with my own behavior. And it took me a while to be able to figure that out. Um, First of all, to recognize it, as you say, and then even once I recognize it, to be able to change my behavior, that was definitely one of those step-by-step progressions, right? I remember maybe, let's say, halfway through the process, I would sometimes get frustrated because people would, you know, 
either give me uh, direct or indirect signals that my behavior, they were not happy with my behavior. And I'm thinking, but I'm so much better. Like I'm so much better. What are you complaining about? This is so much better. But they were right. It wasn't good enough yet, even though it had vastly improved. And so for me, I do still struggle with that. I mean, you know, again, 95% better, but yeah. that was my natural reaction was to get verbally aggressive and just beat someone up with my words. And well, and see, and this is what I love about the progress and, 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 and being able to have these kind of conversations and laugh about them, being in a place where we can laugh and go, yes, <laughs> you know, I love that. And that's kind of like the journey of it is that it, you don't always have to feel miserable because you're, you don't make the right choice in that moment. You can, you, right. It is possible to laugh. It is yes. possible to find people to laugh with about it. And and that's what I love about where we are now in our times is with Zoom and all of this stuff is it opened the door to people who may not be able to find a community right by where they are to find a community, you know, to find the ways to help get through that. Yeah, it's true. It opens up a lot more opportunities and a lot. I mean, even with like recovery meetings, one of the things I tell newbies is if you don't like a certain meeting, but the program philosophy looks like a good fit, go to a different meeting because the different meetings have different leaders. They have different regular members, different percentages of newbies and old timers and, and just different personalities. And so even if you think, okay, well, this is a trauma support group, well, they're not all going to be the right fit for you. They're not all going to have the right mix of personalities for you or the right approach for you. And so with the internet, you can try sample them until you find the place that's the right fit. And that is a great advantage. Well, and for me, I feel that in my body. Like if something's the wrong fit, everything feels tight. Like if I'm talking to someone and I, I'm just getting that bad sense, it just feels tight. Whereas it feels expansive when I feel like, yes, like even seeing what you were doing, <laughs> I felt like so expansive. I was like, I don't know what the chances are of getting her on this show, but I'm going to try because <laughs> I just feel so good about her and and that's the thing is is it's this progress and being aware and being you know just trying to you find your people yes you find your people yes and then the other thing I, I I think about when you talk is you do be patient with yourself as you're going through that process right because it can take a while to find to to find your right place. It can take a, it's going to take a while for you to improve whatever behavior you're trying to change. It's going to take a while, most likely. If it's old and if it's deep, it's going to take a while for you to get that under control. And so it's important to be patient. And even if like even when my progress wasn't really sufficient for the other people, I still needed to notice it for myself so that I could see, yes, okay, you have you still have a ways to go. <laughs> <laughs> but you have improved. And so you know how to do better. It just takes practice. You know, it just takes practice and practice and practice. So much of it, even the positive attitude changes are practice, right? Because my, ad I remember one time I, I was getting ready for work um, and my husband's friend had spent the night and I was complaining, oh, it's going to be a bad day because of this, because of that, because, and because of this. And he looks at me and he goes, well, it's good to have a plan. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I don't think he remembers this conversation, yeah. but to me, it was a light bulb. He's yeah. right. I haven't even left the house and have already decided <laughs> it's going to be a bad day. And yeah. that was just my natural inclination. But his little comment, you know, opened my mind to the, the possibility. And that's what recovery is like. It's you learn this and then you implement it and it takes a while to get it right. And, you know, there's still other things to work on and you you usually can't work on everything at once. And so you have to focus on that incremental improvement. Um, but it's also about keeping your eyes and your ears open for input and ideas and just other people's good um, approach to what you're working on that you maybe can copy or try to implement or, you know, analyze for why, why, why does that look like a good, um, a good way of handling it? Can, can I use that technique in my world? Let me try it. Let me try it a couple of times and see if it helps, you know, all of those things. Yeah. And one of the things I love too, about this process is that when you take that step, 
new doors open up, new people show up, new conver- you know what I mean? It's just like, it tends to lead you down that way of those new things. Like three people might say the same thing to you, read this book and read this book and read this book all in like a short time you read it. And then all of a sudden, then this other thing happens. And it, you know, it's, I just had something like that happen like years ago with a, a woman who was living down the street from me. We never met before. I had just read a book and I was like, okay, I'm going to step out. I'm going to, you know, I'm, I really want to feel better. This woman comes down the street for the first time, never had seen her before that way. To this day, my daughter was one at the time. She just turned 16. She's still my best friend, (laughs) you know, it's just, but, and we've been on the similar paths and we've worked together and we, we go through this together and it's just like, but that one decision, it just helped open a door. Right. And you were ready for it. Right. And and also if it wasn't the right decision, you wouldn't still be friends 15 years later, but it was the initial decision that opened the door, but it was the next time and the next time, the next time that built your relationship, you know, and that you're as close as you are, but it is partly, what are we ready to hear? And I think we, we have to have patience. I mean, I know when I went into recovery for substance use disorder and the trauma, I had broken my life in so many ways. I could not fix all areas at once. I had to prioritize. And that's the way that many of us come in. We have to prioritize. So don't, you know, it's, it's okay to say, yeah, that's a problem, but I just don't have the bandwidth to attack that right now. That has to wait because I have four higher priorities and they're taking up all my mental space, all my ability to move forward. And so part of patience is knowing that you have to set things aside sometimes, because even if you can see them, you can't work on everything at once. Very often you have to make choices about where you're going to spend your energy and what you're going to work on and what's my right next step. And, but don't forget those other things because you want to bring them in and start working on them as soon as you can. Um, But it could, might be six months. It might be a year. You know, you have to be realistic about what's what, how much can I attack at this at one time? Well, and sometimes it's like when we take that first piece, that piece helps the other piece not be so tight. You know what I mean? So, dense and and that was one of the things I found with all the you know help that I've gotten over the years is every step I took the next one wasn't quite as hard it wasn't as quite as hard to peel the layers of the onion you know that's a that's a good point yeah that's a good point I mean part it makes me think of two things one is once we release some of our pain, then whatever we're working on is going to be easier because we're starting out in a healthier place. And But the other also is that we have had practice and developed skills when we were working on the first four areas on our priority list. And so now the fifth area, it seems um, more manageable or, or uh, we can attack it in a more productive way or move, make more forward progress because we have more skills than we would have if we had tried to do it six months earlier. And so everything's easier when we're, when we're making these priorities for ourselves, and when we are, you know, developing our plans and setting our goals and moving forward, we are really learning, right? We are learning, we're teaching ourselves how to be, be, make good decisions, how to make a good plan, how to adjust our plan, you know, as things move around. And, and we're really developing our own confidence and that it will help us attack any other new area of life. I mean, it is it's that sort of iterative process that does get easier with time. You're absolutely right. Well, and I f- find that too, that when we take what we, some of us might consider a misstep or a mistake or th- those, those are just as teachable. Those are just as important. So it's not about regretting those choices. It's about seeing what their value is. You know, for me, that's that was really important to see, oh, I can't believe I spent this time on this, but going, okay, but I learned this from that. I learned this from that. I learned not to do this. I learned what I didn't want from being in that relationship. <laughs> you yes. know, I learned what love wasn't by being there. I learned, you know what I mean? And just trying to take it that way so that I wouldn't self-abuse because that is my go-to is to self-abuse. So for me, that was really important is to see they just were what I needed to see in order to be where I want to be in right now and be where I am right now. And 
if I didn't see what I didn't want, I might not know what I really want. You know, what looks, what healthy looks like. <laughs> but That's true. Know. That's true. And it reminds me of your idea of being loving toward yourself. If we can be loving toward ourselves, it's easier for us to be honest with ourselves when, that we did actually make a mistake or our behavior wasn't what we wanted it to be. And if we're coming from a place of love, it allows us to open up and have that honesty with ourselves, which is really what we need to, in order to learn from, from, the, from what just happened. We have to have that open heart to be able to learn from what happened. Well, and I, for me, that helped me accept love from other people. Because when I was self-abusing, I I didn't even understand what love looked like from other people because it could, uh, what I thought was love was abusive. So I didn't even know what the real lines of love were. Like I had to truly sit down and go, what is my definition of love? Because my examples of love being in a toxic relationship, you know what I mean? And what that looked like, that wasn't love, you know? And I had to see that I'm doing this because I love you was not love, you know, and all of that. I had to really define that. And that was a part of my journey too, is understanding if I, okay, I, I'm going to love myself, but what does that definition of love look like? So that I didn't confuse it with abuse. Because that one yes. is hard for me. Abuse very, and neglect. Very important. Yes, very important. Because so I feel like so many people confuse love with fear. And, and, and it's not the same thing. You know, we can be in a loving place and have a fearful thought or fearful feeling. But the energy of fear and the of love are totally different. Well, what it reminds me of is for me, I think in the beginning, I thought of um, it as being high intensity, right? My husband is really kind of a low key guy. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to appreciate that that's that there's he loves me, but it's not that he's creating, you know, chaos or scenes or, you know, uh, making big gestures, because usually the big gestures were also tied to some form of emotional abuse or control, somebody trying to control me or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so that's what reminds me of for me it felt like if it wasn't high velocity emotion well are we does he really love me are we really connected and I had to learn mm -hmm. how to appreciate his, his much healthier version of love that I was getting but it took me a while to really be able to see it oh I so relate to that. <laughs> like, I, I, was, I was on that because I, I I had gone through the same thing of like going does he love me <laughs> so I was like yeah that's awesome. Oh, thank you so much for sure. continuing the conversation. Anybody who listened, I hope you got something out of this. I know I did. And if you were meant to be here and listening to this aspect of it, then you know you're not alone. If, because if you're relating to this, laughing with us, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> so there are people out there. So just you've opened this door. And if you start looking, I know that you'll find them. Bye. Thank you again for coming. Sure. Thanks for having me. Make sure to follow the links that accompany this episode. You will learn a lot more about today's guest and see what they have going on now. You will also get all the links to follow them on their journeys if this seed resonates with you. Come back next week for another Seed of Wisdom. If you loved what you saw or listened to, don't forget to subscribe to the channel.